gentlemen. Oh, good. Welcome. Uh, welcome back. Um, <laughs> such a formal occasion. Um, in the second part, Matty G is going to lead off looking at prefabrication, particularly around digital fabrication and the cap capabilities that s straight from computer to um, manufacturing device, and the, the capacities that those sorts of technologies now make available. Um, before I'll round out by showing a couple of slide, couple of additional slides um, on the NRAS project, so you can keep that in mind for the with the ones that Fred's already shown you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm going to start off a little bit primitive. Um, so we, the word digital has been brought up, <laughs> and um, so uh, this this um, long strips of uh, green hardwood. Um, ripped um, and fixed off at different points so that when they um, buckle and twist, they do that in a different way. Um, oh, hang on a second. Oh. Hear me again? Um, I'm, a, I'm a carpenter, uh, for, probably first and foremost, and, um, and joiner. I, um, I've had a pretty uh, a reasonably long career now in construction. Uh, a lot of it's been very timber centric, and um, I uh, what I'm going to show you tonight is is really uh, it's all collaboration. So I've I've in some way been involved in most of it, but um, I'm going to call up some names and and um, and um, remind uh, myself and you guys of all the other people that have been involved in um, what I'm going to show you. So um, I came back to to Tasmania. I'm Tasmanian, but I came back nine years ago, and um, I just wanted to, um, um, my main interest is the, the relationship between architecture and construction. So I've gone from this um, origin in construction and, um, and moved through building design and, and studying, still studying architecture. I tried to submit my most re recent assignment to Greg tonight and he wouldn't accept it because <laughs> it's a conflict of interest. Um, this is a... Uh, this is a project called Asante that um, I was the builder uh, for, and it was I think 100, about 140 pieces, fully prefabricated, pre um, uh, pre cladded uh, timber building over two stories, um, fully coordinated in CAD um, uh, as pieces to lift together in um, on you know on site in Lauderdale. I'm going to start here. This is really interesting. I arrived in um, I, when we were going to come come back to Tassie with my family, just about to have a baby, um, and my fourth child. Um, I I call, called builders from Melbourne and said, uh, look, looking for a job, and I got a job with this um, with a local builder, and um, I'd already I'd already been trained as a, a draftsman, and um, I was I was you know uh, leading hand on a uh, eleven gabled you know, really, really steep pitched, huge timber house, um, solid timber house um, in Waterworks. And, um, uh, and the normal way is that, that I'd been taught as a, um, as a carpenter was to get all the floor plates down, uh, get, all, sorry, get the floor down, and then to um, basically get string lines and work out the whole building and stand up all the, all the ends. Now, this, this building has, um, interestingly, it had a double, it had a structural ridge on it. And... Um, and it was a double, we were lifting um, 2 by 240 by 45 hardwood um, structural ridges on the top of these posts in the centre um, at major height. And um, I said to the guys, and, you know, there were three carpenters on it, look, just let me go and I'll go and draw it up in CAD. And I did cutting lists for the whole building. This was the, the building. But you can see these sort of, these are all, this is all hardwood. And, um, and it was a dream for me as a carpenter because I'd been in Victoria, which is all frame and truss, I was saying to Fred before, um, and I'd come back to hardwood world. And, um, and I got to build this really big gable, you know, big building with lots of gables. And, um, but it, it seemed really logical to me um, to, to do this in um, 2D CAD um, rather than draw it on the floor, especially when it rains. And, um, and, and it was, what was really interesting is, is the guys that 
um, I, and the builder and the owner who was around were all totally freaked out with me being off in, in the shed drawing this up on my computer, n- half trusting me. And it all came together like a song. And, um, um, but if, uh, if I went to, to do this again on the next project, they still would have been freaked out. You know, and I think we we talk. I'm going to talk a lot about digital ideas, and um, in in architecture, we can have really really big ideas about what we can do. Um, but unless the construction industry is prepared to go with it, um, and unless they learn, unless we have a strong relationship with our construction industry, none of it's going to really happen at any pace. Um, and people are going to do things the way that they're used to doing them. Um, so I kind of I kind of moved on. Um, and um, I'm going to show you a series of projects. This project um, was built in Southport and um, really interesting project because we, 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 we became our own individual little frame and truss manufacturer. Um, and um, and we, did, we did some large, box, really big large box, box beams. It's got some big cantilevers. But the really hard part about this project was that it had a um, two, two story sort of um, high sort of ply ceiling in it and um, I, um, I designed, I'd done a lot of work for a developer um, when I was younger who uh, did a lot of pl- really high big ply lined high end buildings in, um, in New South Wales and um, I, I spent hours and hours lying on my back um, straight, you know, getting all the, um, the packing and blocking out for ply interiors, months of it. And um, I wanted to come up with a way to um, get a top and bottom surface that I could immediately fix off to. So what, what we did is we, um, um, uh, we basically used I-beams. We strengthened the I-beams, um, the, um, the uh, web of the I-beams with um, structural ply. But on the outside, we, um, uh, on um, the, um, f- the flange to flange connection, we put... A, um, a ply piece on each side, and the actual depth of that ply varies continuously through the beam, um, so that because the the not the floor the floor the pitching plates aren't um, square and they're not parallel to each, each other, and um, the points um, that the um, the uh, sort of the ridge meets they're, they're not on the you know they're on unusual angles, um, and we 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 basically said to our engineer well we can build it. They weren't, it was going to cost too much to calculate, but we actually ended up live testing it with the engineers. And this is the actual roof that went up. And um, it, um, the whole, whole project, because it was in Southport, we wanted to prefabricate it. So it was similar to what uh, Greg was showing you before, where we sort of had that next step of fabrication where we had OSB clad uh, wall systems. And, um, um, but interestingly, all the ply components were cut and fitted um, really, really accurately. Um, and that saved a lot on cost, but also the control of a project which is, has a long distance from Hobart on that crazy windy road all the way down to Southport. Um, and oh, interesting little story about timber here with Austral. We used Austral plywood. We ran out of, um, we, we, I think we were four sheets short um, and told, I think we were so, and it, and it was a Christmas delivery of the project. Austral said, we're not making a new batch until March. <laughs> And um, you can't get any. And we managed to get four sheets from a hardware store in WA to get through the project. So supply is a pretty important thing and, and often can be quite difficult in feature grade architectural. So um, otherwise we wouldn't have handed over and our architect, Matt Williams, um, would have crucified us. <laughs> no, he probably wouldn't, but it was, it was an important one to hand over at Christmas. Um, so... What's the difference between manufacturing and, um, and site building? Um, we, we have, this is Prefab Lab specifically, but this isn't just Prefab Lab. There's a lot of builders around the world um, uh, that are effectively manufacturers and builders. And um, we, we our, our sort of strategy is, is we have, you know, we're a builder. We think of tools. We have tools. It's just that our tools, um, and like a lot of other builders probably outside of Australia, include um, a range of more sort of um, complex pieces of kit like CNC, um, forklifts, cranes, trolleys, rails or prefabricated rails, 
benches on wheels on different levels. So we, we think in a sequential way around how we construct things. And, um, and we, we have our, our little toolbox and um, that requires a fair bit of effort to, to develop your infrastructure. Um, but we don't think um, big manufacturer. We think use and work with other subcontracts similar to the way the current construction industry works to bring everything together at once, collaborate, get really close to where we can stage a project and, um, and deliver on it. And this is a process. Prefab Lab at this stage in its sort of uh, uh, strategy and or its strategic plan has an aim to become an interface between architecture and construction. So we actually want to move away from being the builder. We want to move into the place of being the enabler between architects and building designers and engineers and uh, the lead contractors, so for, for projects. Um, and we have to think really how, how, um, how are we going to be in Tasmania because whenever you're thinking about a project, your scale is really, really important. Um, and this underpins the decisions. Um, and we don't live in a big city. We live in a small place and we need to be nimble. We need to change. We're going to do a smaller number of projects. And every time, I was just having a chat with Fred, every time we do something in Tassie, it's, a rep it's not a repetition of what we know. We're, we're bringing little bit of bits from the previous project and we're doing a new one. And because we're in architectural building, um, it, it, it requires us to be very, very dynamic. That makes us strong, but it's also um, pretty complex. Um, so we're going for the one on the right, um, where if you were to look at a fabricator that has a digital background like... Um, uh, Modscape or um, Prebuilt or Archiblocks in Melbourne, they're doing a much larger volume and, um, uh, and they're also repeating uh, a sequence of construction and digital information over and over again. So here's a lovely lab, Adam Holmstrom has left um, Prefab Lab, now he's following a career in landscape architecture, a very big mind, um, often um, to, to be a successful business in this, we need um, a whole range of different personalities. Um, my personality is largely creative and, and also quite, um, um, quite dynamic around bringing people together and, and working through problems and quite innovative with a construction career where Adam's really quite computational and mathematical. And um, you need to have different people. Um, and Adam, for a long time, um, I've collaborated on a lot of projects with him um, he was a, a great enabler um, uh, for Prefab Lab. I um, just wanted to show you a comp where we went to a more complex project. Michael Shrapnel was the architect for this project. Um, and um, we, we were interested in, it was a complex shape, uh, curved roof, curved plan, uh, circular sort of plan, um, melding into an existing um, rectangle um, and we, um, we coordinated a whole series of cassettes um, to come together um, and we used the CNC to label um, which was kind of interesting uh, and a whole lot of pieces had sort of a jigs way of sort of going together as jigsaws and, um, and this is that same piece, this is sort of, sort of got sort of like these little spines coming off them as connectors, this, um, this project had uh, a portal frame arrangement that carried a whole range of pre-insulated cassettes um, that were set out on a curve. Um, and then this is in Falmouth, and this is sort of starting to go off. You can see the curve in the block wall, which then which was became you know quite beautiful masonry below. These portals were again load tested by the engineers. I think I stood up on a, um, a mobile scaff and loaded up with concrete blocks. Um, at, at a certain load and, and failure before we worked out that our portals would work um, and there was um, steel connections on the inside of the portals and they become they, they actually became feature um, or black butt feature grade portals and um, the top uh, were pre-insulated ply cassettes um, so this is probably our first big sort of digital sort of step moving from full one to one digital information into fabrication on a CNC for a project um, which is quite a, a beautiful building um, um, in a really, really uh, beautiful site. Um, this is another another one. CNC, which is which means um, uh, computer numerical control, um, is uh, a way of it's it's basically printing. So if you look, you go home and look at your printer. 
and it, and it writes out words or prints out an image for you. This is pretty much the same thing, except for we're just moving from uh, the digital information in CAD into, um, into code, um, into a, um, a router on a gantry. Um, and um, it's probably the most primitive version of robotics in, um, uh, in industry. And, um, and then in this circumstance, obviously, we've got lots of little marks, but we had uh, for Asante, that project in Lauderdale, we actually did CNC cut formwork. And um, it allowed us this very high tolerance accuracy for the whole prefabrication to come together um, later. And um, it worked really well, and we've done it quite a lot since. Whenever we're in complexity, and you can see with this formwork, part of it's CNC cut, so there's a little column connection there, but part of it's traditional just um, uh, shoring. And, um, um, and so we were cautious that we didn't overdo it um, and over-intellectualise the idea. So part of the complex bits we did in the CNC and the bits in between at length are infills. Um, and also, interestingly, there's a... Um, a chimney going in there, and instead of precast, fully precast chimney going in on the in the centre of the building, which became sort of a structural element. Um, this is some of that same building. This is a box beam pre-insulated with paper pulp. Um, we have a paper pulp pump, um, and um, as a form of insulation. Um, but it, with our box beams, we did actually have them uh, pre-organised and pre-trenched um, um, on the CNC. It, it's a pretty complicated thing to do at our scale. It's something we probably would never do again. Um, if we were a much bigger manufacturer in Germany, it probably is a really good idea, but in Tassie, it's mad. Um, and, um, um, but, you know, we, we're trying and testing things, and um, all, of our, um, all of our box beams, obviously, we're working with... You can see all the cassettes in the background all stacked. This, this project had 140 pieces, sort of similar to this, that were pre-insulated and then pre-cladded. Um, and this column, this is a column connection coming down into the ground um, and, um, and also there's a whole lot of, uh, oh, see this little piece of black bit uh, above, that's a piece of sacrificial um, set out for, for cladding. So the building, the cladding for the building, you didn't have to think about where the cladding piece went, it had a sacrificial um, piece of OSB pre-cut for the cladding to, to slot into for us to locate it on, in the factory. Um, we sort of spent a bit of time looking at um, how we systemise architecture and we're, we're about to release a series of four pavilions that are all sort of based on the same system of construction. Um, and this was our first prototype, this sort of really simple gable structure. Um, and this is how it sort of unfolds on site with a steel gable in, which um, basically allowed us to... Um, uh, it was a simple, the simplest way we could think about continuing a glass balustrade with steel connections. Um, but everything else is um, uh, a combination of cassette, a uh, combination of prefabricated wall frames, some pre-clad OSB elements. But effectively, this uh, project would have come together on site in probably about three days. Um, still very neat ar architecture, but it's also got a, a concealed gutter in it. And one of the cool things that we often do is, is with our gutters, we, we make continuous boxes, um, pre-cut um, on site. We slide them in and you just lift up one end um, to get your fall and screw it off to the side and the height's considered already in CAD beforehand. Um, so this is our first sort of go at trying to come up with a product um, digitally. Interestingly, uh, we're, what part of this system is, to, is, or the idea behind this is to have at least 70% common component um, that we control uh, as, as cost um, through um, these series of architectural pavilions. Um, I'm going to jump very fast into um, the digital um, part of what um, I wanted to talk about, or I just want to show you some opportunities. Um, one thing that's happened in... Um, uh, architecture and engineering over um, the last 10 years is we, people that, um, well, architects, let's say creatives, um, uh, ha have started to use visual scripting. Um, and it means that we no longer really have to learn a program like Python um, to script information to, to um, uh, create or analyze 
uh, digital event in architecture, we can actually do it in, in a much more sort of visual, creative way through visual scripting. And um, at architecture school now, most, um, most students will be um, using uh, a visual scripting um, uh, program associated with their CAD. Um, in this circumstance, it's Grasshopper. Um, and um, we've done stacks of CNC, pre-cut, pre-organised CNC um, uh, interior-based um, projects. We've done, I think, about five uh, restaurants or bars. And um, uh, each time I like to do uh, some sort of, um, uh, I, I guess, sort of geometric or some sort of filigree or some sort of detail um, um, with the CNC. And the CNC gives us really quick opportunities to... to um, to decorate, and um, one of the big ones that I um, was involved in, with was um, Brook Street Pier Marketplace, um, and we came up with like a dynamic um, model um, through Grasshopper uh, to work with the interior designer Georgina Freeman uh, um, around the marketplace that allowed, effectively allowed us to punch out the um, CNC cutting. Um, at the last minute for um, once we had all the other information in place from the builder um, because we actually didn't know where all the columns were going to be. In, in, at the last minute in this project, it was, um, the information was coming very late. So um, by coming up with a, a dynamic model that could change, um, um, immediately change our files for cutting, um, we, we were able to deliver on the project and there was, I think, 550 sheets of ply was cut um, and um, painted and stained and um, CNC cut. So it was a continuous CNC cut for long hours over um, I think about three and a half weeks prior to install. And, and um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without the dynamic modelling or that digital fabrication component beforehand um, or deliver on that project. Um, these stools we did in Pilgrim Cafe or Pilgrim Restaurant. Um, I was the builder for Pilgrim Restaurant and Standard, and um, but these stools I worked with the client on, um, and they they they're really the cheapest stool I could ever make, and um, it was a really great little project for me because I I got to do a very minimal stool. I got to cut I think it was two stools, no three stools per sheet of 12 mil low grade like the CD face ply. And um, we, were, we were producing um, the stools at something like, with cutting costs and everything like that, at something like $30 a stool, um, designed with a client whose mum happens to be an upholsterer. So it was sort of a... Um, and, um, and we could also produce enough so that he could have, you know, a, um, um, more um, whenever he wanted them. But one of the really cool things about... Uh, uh, product design or architectural design in the world today is we can design a product. If it's got good legs, um, we can sell the file or we can give the file away. And um, there's, there's a whole uh, open source network going on around the world um, uh, around the sharing of, um, ca of, of cutting files in furniture with um, a flat you know, uh, product like sheet product like ply. Um, this is just, um, this is, I'm sorry, Greg, this is um, metal. I'm, I'm, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Core 10. Core 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is, um, this is just next to uh, the Next 50 office in Collins Street. Um, it's, the, it's Jerry DeGrice's garage. Really pretty, different forms of oxidisation um, going on um, on Core 10. Uh, I'm working on the Macquarie Street Hotel with Hutchinson um, at the moment and um, one of the things I'm doing is I'm doing cutting jigs. I did a similar thing for NRAS in Varesk, um, but basically they have 550 metres of, of the same slatted macrocarpus screening to do. So, um, so what I've, we, we started off working with Hutchies on this um, with NRAS. There's a lot of timber cladding macrocarpus. There's 26 kilometres, lineal kilometres of macrocarpa on NRAS, and it was all put together with jigs. 
and the reduction in labour cost is, is something like 50, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. By coming up with a jig that regularly allows you to drop in the macrocarpa, macrocarpa loses its shape quite a bit, it's green, um, so this forces it into the right position before it's fixed off to skill angles and the angles are, I don't know if you can see these little upstairs here, the angles slot in that position, they're pre-drilled. Um, so I do a lot of jigs um, for, um, to reduce labour cost and this is, a, this is another, pretty much worldwide, this is another common strategy around timber, around getting the project done faster um, in a more coordinated way with CNC accuracy, which is sub one mil. Um, and also deliverable because it's a, obviously that big jig can come together with legs, stand up, people can climb all over it. Um, and, um, and it's a big event. This is being done in the basement of Macquarie Street, ho of the hotel in Macquarie Street, but that's what's delivered on the, off the bench and pretty much um, easy delivery with a forklift becomes a big assembly that, um, uh, that's all square, all set, set out at to, to the mill to then go on and fabricate. Um, <clears throat> so we, we have got a very big interest in proto prototyping um, and we think that prototyping is a very, very um, strong way to get through um, larger projects or do proof of con concept for larger projects. So um, you can see a couple of ivy houses in the background but this was the NRAS um, prototype and Greg's going to talk a lot more about this but I just wanted to, um, I wanted to show you a little bit more. This was lifting it. Manitou was a, is a good strategy to move these sort of size um, boxes around. Um, and, but one of the things that we did is, and this is part of more where we want to go as a business and as an enabler, is, is kind of, it's more systems and process work um, with the larger builder. We, um, we tended with this project um, with Hutchinson as a consultant and um, we assisted them in the whole project in terms of developing the price. Um, and um, it involved a whole range of uh, jobs. And my first job was to spend time driving around Launceston and looking for the right space to build it um, and, and strategy. That was a, a, my main recommendation was to use a Manitou to move things. And we had, there's two main strategies in modular architecture for fabrication. One's rails and one's um, blocks. Um, basically, they, they need different areas in terms of construction and rails cost bigger. We were lucky to bring rails down from Yatla um, to in, the, um, in the space in Launceston for Inveresk. Um, and it was also awesome for me because I'd never seen how cool they were beforehand and I always built off blocks. So um, we uh, developed, this was part of my pitch to Hutchinson, we developed a whole lot of programmatic drawings for assembly and trained their team to assemble the, um, uh, the modules and also we developed the work rates, um, the number of modules that would be completed at what rate through the factory and delivery time. And um, that was really interesting work. We also, developed, we also did the quality control. Um, this was a, I threw this in because this was an idea around moving components around the factory. Greg talked about, you know, a third level in fabrication that's it's effectively digitally coordinated, but this is a European um, project, but um, NRES had its plumbing pre-coordinated within it, and the plumbing tolerances that we developed in NRES and the riser, the core riser work that we all did together was really, really um, tight, um, and, um, uh, but achieved through digital, but also making a prototype. Um, there was a, this, this, three caves, Scott's here. <laughs> Scott and George were the architects of three caves. We did, we were a, another great project where we were lucky enough to be the, um, the prototyper um, for, for this. Interesting um, prefabrication pre in, um, in black butt, really heavy timber, really hard wearing on our machines. Um, we're doing another black butt project at the moment and um, it's just, it's just, um, it's such a, um, an amazing timber and um, super durable but um, this, this, this prototyping process had um, uh, improvement um, opportunities in it with um, JAWS and Parks and Wildlife but it also 
um, underpinned, I guess, the cost and cost estimation. And, um, and it also tried out the connections um, and the steel fabrication um, and also the joinery. Um, there was some amazing, we made these, uh, I haven't actually been out to look at the final project complete, um, but um, this, this project allowed um, uh, parks um, to see their, um, um, you know, different components of all the huts um, potentially in one. Um, we, um, we, we have, a, this is a, a, a bench in our factory for docking on both sides and um, we have a whole lot of strategies within, um, within Electrona around how we move things around the space and we're really lucky because we have a gantry. Um, um, these are solid timber or black bark windows and doors. That, um, okay, so I had a conversation yesterday, very interesting conversation with the plastics, uh, with, um, ah, I can't think of the name, Replas. Um, and we were just talking about the process of making their bollards and their um, shapes and forms and everything like that and they've got a number of robot arms from South Australian automotive industry. Um, if, if, if I said to you, probably in, you know, said to anybody that we're going to be using these things to build buildings, it's really hard to understand. Um, it's, it's, it's how far away is it? Like, at, you know, where, where would you pitch that to be? Um, and um, there's two forms of uh, three-dimensional sort of derivative um, cutting. That One's gantry base, which is five-axis cutting, and the other one is arms. Um, we're not far away. And, um, and in an academic sense, we're starting to look at it. Um, but I, I reckon we've, you know, there's already manufacturers in five axis in Europe that are doing large sculptural things in timber. Um, obviously, there's traditional stair building. Most traditional stair building um, in the States and Europe is still is on five axis, pre-programmed. But I think we're five years away and um, of this starting to enter into our industry. And um, I was amazed that a small family company or two families um, went and bought a whole lot of robots and, and set them up in a factory in Ballarat and uh, doing reasonably well with it. Um, you can get a hammer online, um, but it's, it's a pretty crude looking event, but yeah, flat pack. I'm really interested in flat pack and there's a huge potential in um, the movement of material through flat pack um, and, um, and people like it. There's little tabs that connect these pieces. You can create buildings this way and um, CLT. We're building a CLT house in Tasmania at the moment um, with Store. The company that's supplying it is um, Store Enzo. So we're um, um, Prefab Lab is working with Next Fifty Architects around um, the delivery of a whole CL, two-story CLT house. Uh, the base stage is complete, um, and we're about to um, push the button on the manufacture in Finland. Um, and um, it's also like the this Store project. Um, with um, Lendlease in Melbourne, it's a feature grade interior. This one, the Safites and the um, in the um, in the verandas, and there's an internal uh, feature uh, feature wall. This house we're doing is floor, wall, and ceiling feature grade um, CLT, um, and we'll probably I think we're uh, eight to eight to ten weeks away from delivery. Um, and, and putting one up. And I had a little bit of involvement with the walkways um, and particularly the stairwells in NRAS. So just starting to get to know CLT and learn um, as a business about how we can enable CLT projects, um, and which have certainly have a place in our industry in a range of different places. Interestingly, we're doing parallel projects in Prefab Lab between uh, SIP, which is um, super insulated panel, and CLT. So we've got one house going on that's a SIP house and another house that's going on um, that's CLT. Both of them are architecturals and we, our team is learning these two systems at the same time for the first time. Um, thought I'd just throw this shigaru um, uh, combination of um, bamboo, tension, um, membrane structure and um, there's a timber substructure behind me. Um, Metropole parasol big scale um, digital fabricated project. Um, if somebody asked me what I'd like to do next, 
any of you architects or designers out there <laughs> um, want to do something crazy, um, I'd love to be involved. Um, we will see projects like this unfold in Australia um, um, in, in our own way. Um, this is open source uh, prefab. This is WikiHouse. Good thing to look at. Maybe, you know, it's got some really great um, uh, ideas around it, but effectively it's about design your own um, prefabricated ply um, structure or form. Um, and I um, thought I'd show you that. There's a whole range, I'm going back down into the small scale, there's a whole range of different ways to digitally connect things these days, where, which relate to traditional carpentry and joinery, but are new um, and sometimes really beautiful. Um, and yeah, so I'm looking, I'm, I'm effectively looking as a business out from a digital environment into, um, into a very practical world. Um, I started this, I wanted to show you the beginning bit, which is me arriving in Tassie with that, that big um, timber, you know, hardwood um, house. Um, we really need to understand our construction industry. We need to get closer to our construction industry um, early in the piece um, if we want to do great things as designers and um, architects um, in timber. And um, uh, the, the closer those two things can come together, the more potential there is and the more we'll, we'll see all of what, all those great things, um, how they can progress. Um, yeah. So that's what I've got to say. Any questions? <laughs> now, I think one thing, to read, one thing to remember between the two presentations is that both Matt and Fred are using digital design all the time. So in every building that Fred has showed you, every solution has come out of a digital design software that then is driven through to cutters, a whole range of automatic cutters which are then numbered and arranged and put together through 3D modelling. And I think what Matt has shown you, sorry, between the two we see what at one end what can be a highly utilitarian approach that can move towards major architectural structures and on the other end we've, we've taken an, a an architectural approach that can move also back towards engineering structures and utilitarian approaches. And for different types of components, be they structural components or envelope components or architectural components. And both are prefab, both are different, uh, are prefabrication at different scales. The, the NRAS job was, had a lot of prefabrication in it, both Fred and Matt were involved in various stages. Fred shown the roof going up and the trusses and the design requirements. Um, I was part of the design team and one of the things that we were involved with it was trying was getting the modularization of the the apartments, the 120 apartments that had to be built, with the architects, who were Morrison Bredelbach, uh, Circa Morris Nunn and Jack Burrell. So the concept of introducing prefabrication came from the very first meeting before the job was won, which was how are we going to A, satisfy the client's requirement for innovation, preferably with wood, um, but also then to do something with that they could be assured would actually work. So the concept was is that we just prefabricate the thing and we would minimise risk by making these as much like house framing as possible. And that was a deliberate strategy, is that we didn't want to scare the horses and so we didn't want to introduce uh, crazy CLT stuff. We wanted things that could be re related directly back to everyday practice and things that could be required at the hardware store. And that line was used in the meetings to win the project. Everything is just from the hardware store, we're just doing it slightly different, differently. So this was a, a prototype model, 
It was then converted into a three-dimensional models by the architects. It was made in prototype um, in Matt's workshop. Um, Matt and his team documented all of the various stages and things that needed to be considered during the construction process. And all of the services were installed into the prototype so, and so that everything, so the builder, builders, public tender, the builders could be shown exactly how everything fitted to everything else. Now, up until the prototype was finished, put on the truck, driven around, the university had still not formally committed to a timber job. There was another option, the tilt slab concrete option, which was going to be pulled out again if these were damaged during transportation. And as it was, they worked, which wasn't a surprise to me, but it was a, a surprise to a number of other people. Um, and then, the, so the timber project was, the timber option was, it, was adopted. That was what was tendered and Hutchins won the job. So effectively what we had then was five, 15 modules being built at the same, uh, sorry, 15? 15, to start off with, yeah. 15 being made at the same time, so that you had um, five locations, was it five? Yeah, five locations, where the modules would stay in each location for three days, and there'd be a certain cycle of work that would be done on those modules during that three-day period, then the module would move along to the next bay along rails. So these two modules at the end of this line were in the same production stage, those two are in the same production stage, and the modules were assembled in such a way that the tradesmen knew what time they had to come in to do which job. And there were little panels put at the front, which then had the time that each tradesman was to come in and do a particular task. Now the modules were complete to such a stage that technically the only thing that needed to happen was them to be put in place, and then when the building was up for final cleaning, you take the door off, you take the panels off, and someone goes in and does final cleaning. So everything was installed, the services were installed, plumbing was in, and all the plumbing and services were run to one duct that was situated at the back of the building. Then that had a number of fit-off locations which you could achieve without going in at all. So, and then everything was tested here, plumbing, electrics, everything were tested so that when they got on site, basically just the simple connections needed to be made. These are the modules going into place. Um, there was some, some experimentation with how many should be delivered at once, and they ended up delivering 10 in a day. So now prefabrication was not just limited to the modules, as you saw from Fred's photographs. The roof was also prefabricated, in that it was prefabricated in a couple of sections. Fred made the trusses in his plant, all to a plan, they were brought to site, then assembled on the ground into a larger prefabricated component with cladding and servicing, and then picked up from there and put on top of the building. Now there was a lot of learning through here, there was one or two mistakes, um, but generally the, the build went off quite well. The roof of the modules was fully trafficable, so that when they were put into place, um, the, the people wanting to install or prepare for the next one could walk across the roof, so there was very little OH and S issues. And these things were so rigid that we, uh, I think the general thought was that we'd get these to five to six storeys without any additional reinforcing on what we had. And they were designed so that the ends of the modules were, were 
well, they weren't butted together. There was a 30 millimeter space and that a sheet metal strip was placed across the ends of both modules and screwed off. And that was continuous down the modules. So effectively, the modules were braced in one direction from OSB in the wall frame, and then they were tied together in this direction by just sheet metal fixed from the outside. So there was no internal fixing except for pack, sorry, the only, the, the gaps between the modules were packed with uh, um, non-flammable um, insulation, and then the outside was finished with strip, and was fixed together with strip, and then the final cladding was just stripped over between the modules. Now, this had cladding on it. Both ends were clad when they were installed. So that's what they look like going up. They were installed on this concrete um, rails, basically because flood level there is about here. That's the 100 year flood line. So downstairs was officially sacrificial and as allocated for car parking and service spaces. The modules are all up the top. And then CLT was used in the common spaces in the center. But basically I was talking about the, the modules. So this is the, the building um, with all the modules in place and the externals being framed. This is the, the trusses roof that Fred discussed. And these walkways were designed to suspend off the trusses. So as Fred was talking about, the trusses had to take this particular load. They were suspended off here, so there was no columns underneath the, the walkways at all. The walkways were CLT panels that were fitted onto a steel ledger um, bolted onto the edge of the panels. So if we round up, is that if we looked at some of the range of things we've dealt with tonight, we've dealt with simple residential, multi-story residential, um, architectural fitting, zero, one, two, and three-dimensional prefabrication from relatively simple components all the way through to fully finished, ready to install um, apartments in, three, in a 3D module. So now all of these are done in the state. All of them are done without complicated material species, material combinations. We can't make CLT here yet, or we can't make, we can now make CLT in Australia, um, but we don't make it in the state. But all of these things are readily achievable with local suppliers and local skills. All right, so I'm open for questions if anyone's got any, and or I can do an ad, and I'll do an ad for the next seminar. Questions. <laughs>